everybody. I'm uh, Jerry Davis. I'm the artistic director of Burning Coal Theater Company. As most of you know, uh, Nathalie Ray, who's uh, on my screen to my left, uh, is our development director. She's helped coordinating the Talkback series. And we have with us today uh, Renee Nixon. Uh, Renee, hi, how are you? With a very uh, impressive backdrop, uh, I might say. Yeah. And um, we have uh, um, Jordan Lichtenheld, uh, who is the director of uh, Forever. Uh, Jordan, hey. Hi. Also uh, impressive in many ways. Uh, uh, Amelia Cowens Taylor, who is performing that uh, Herculean role in, in Forever. Uh, and uh, Byron Jennings, who is performing an equally uh, challenging role in Until the Flood. Hi, Byron, how are you? So, um, so what I thought we would do, if you guys are okay with this, we can take questions either through the chat function, which is probably at the bottom of your uh, screen, uh, or if you want to just raise your hand, uh, then, then we'll, uh, Nathalie or I will try to call on you. But I thought I would start out with asking the two actors uh, if they would um, talk just a little bit about um, the challenge of doing uh, a one-person show, whether it's the first time you've done this and, and uh, how it compares to working in a more traditional multi-character, multi-actor play. Uh, Mimi, do you mind if we start with you? Sure. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, anytime one person has to memorize 60 pages of text, that's always in and of itself um, a, a Herculean task. But then to to really have to um, ingest most of it alone um, by yourself is hard, uh, you know. And that's you know with COVID, um, the isolation that we already feel, the um, material itself, which is at times sad, uh, uh, sometimes gleeful and joyful, but many times very heavy on top of what is going on in the world. I think that, I know I can speak for myself, I, to have to hold all of that and push all of this inside and get it down into your DNA to really bring authenticity to it was a challenge, but um, I think what really drove me um, through it was the fact that I knew that the impact of, of the material and how it was going to land on people was going to be a place of self-healing, uh, restoration, and it was going to take people on their own journeys of forgiveness uh, and, in, and introspection uh, of themselves as well. Byron, uh, do you want to jump in there? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I echo so many of the sentiments that uh, Mimi just mentioned. Uh, I put this on a, a Facebook post on uh, Friday when, when my show opened, just how <laughs> when I sent the email up to Jerry saying that I would, uh, I would do this, immediately thinking, what in the hell, Byron, are you getting yourself into? Um, because, you know, used to being on stage with amazing fellow actors and, and, and being able to play those scenes uh, with them. So I wondered how it would be just me solo, right? And at home learning the lines, I couldn't do it the way I normally would. Um, so that just sort of having a different method for learning all of the lines. Um, and yeah, it, we're in a, we're in a pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, and the added sort of stress and isolation that I think all of us have felt at moments throughout this almost year long journey, um, you know, March what, 16th is, or 23rd, 16th, 23rd is kind of when everything sort of shut down. So we're almost coming up on a year. Um, having to navigate through that emotionally and physically, um, it was scary. And, you know, coupled that with, I thought, Mimi and I have talked about this too, but of course, uh, yield 
imposter syndrome. <laughs> you know, thinking that, oh my gosh, Jerry's going to be like, why did, you know, Jerry and Renee are going to be like, why did we even hire him? He doesn't even know what he's doing, even though I've been doing this for over 20 years, but still feeling like this, this was going to be my first one man show. And so I felt the responsibility. Um, I didn't want to let anyone down. I didn't want to let Jerry down. I didn't want to let Renee down. I didn't want to let uh, Dale down. So feeling a great sense of responsibility. And then of course, the actual subject matter, right? Um, everything that they're talking about, then we're still talking about now, right? Um, and the difficulty that comes with that, uh, at the end of the show, when I do the character Louisa a certain uh, second time, she talks about um, her last couple of lines is uh, everything that we can't help remembering and knowing, knowing in our bones. Um, all of these things that these characters are going through still in the bones and the DNA of people today. Um, so having to access that and um, we rehearsed on the day of the insurrection. Uh, and, you know, Renee was so wonderful. She said, you should have, I, I came to rehearsal. She said, you should have called me and told me that you wanted to cancel. But I just, it was a welcome distraction, but it was hard. It was hard. And, and so we're seeing these events happening today that still play into what the characters are talking about seven years ago. Um, and so all of that made for quite the journey, um, which I'm still on, you know, just because we're opened. I don't, I don't stop looking. I don't stop, I don't stop learning. I don't stop mining for, for things. So, yeah. Thank you both. That's, uh, that's very informative. Um, uh, we directors have the imposter syndrome sometimes too. <laughs> I can assure you. Um, we, I want to hear from the directors. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from an audience member, but let me first go to um, Renee. Uh, if you can talk, uh, I, I know the answer to this for you, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway, and that you and Jordan both answered, if you don't mind. Have you had an experience working on a one-person show before, and is it different uh, for you in terms of the way you approach it as a director? Um, from how you might approach a show with, say, eight or 10 or 12 people in the cast? Yeah, well, for me, Jerry, yes, I have done, um, a, well, not really a one-person show, but I've done shows with monologues. I have a play called Worried and Worried um, 2.0, which is a group of characters that are all come from different ways and different lives, and they're all monologues about um, life. And actually, Mimi was actually in both of those shows. So I know all about that. So, so yeah, so for me, doing this was um, very uh, familiar, but it was just interesting only having one actor to play all the parts. So I had to get in my head, how was I going to make Byron into an older Black woman, a middle-aged white woman, into two, uh, two white men? You know, how am I going to make him and have people see all these different characters, not just in his voice and his mannerisms, how he looks, the different setups of the sets. So I had to play it all in my hand. And so I just had to start dreaming about it. And after I met Byron, I was like, oh, and we started working on it. I start, saw it all come to life. So it's, it's similar, but different, I will say. Right. Jordan, how about you? Is this a, is this a new experience for you? It's a very new experience in so many different ways for me. Um, Forever was actually the first show that I've ever directed. Um, so I've, before this, I've never had the role as director. I've been actor, um, run crew, dramaturg mostly. Um, so just that in itself was a new experience for me being the one who was like, okay, this is my vision. And all these people are working together to kind of bring this vision of mine to life. Um, I will say that with it being a one person show, I personally really enjoyed the experience of it. It felt really um, intimate and um, collaborative, which is something that I always love when working on a project. Um, yeah. 
Jordan, uh, I'm going to stay with you for a second uh, and then uh, ask Mimi to respond to this as well. A question from Rita, who is uh, among our audience today. She asked, what do you feel was the message to take away from forever? That's a really big question, isn't it? It's a very big question with, I think, multiple answers. Um, I think for us, it was ultimately about this idea of forgiveness. Um, looking back at oneself and being able to look at everything that happened to you and being able to appreciate the growth that you've made as a person, um, enjoying the journey of becoming one's true self and finding joy in who that person was and is pers um, presently. Um, and then also just like about the complexities of parent and child relationships, especially mother-daughter, especially African-American mother-daughter relationships in particular, because there's a lot of weight behind those kinds of relationships. So those were the main takeaways that I personally felt. Uh, Mimi? All I can say is ditto <laughs> to all of that. Um, one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about working with Jordan as a, as a director, um, is that she was extremely collaborative and we made room at every rehearsal for character development, character discovery. Um, and every day that we were together, there was a new discovery. There was a new um, nuance and a new um, way of understanding uh, this character who many of you all may have uh, caught is nameless. She, she, we never know her name but we are very well aware of who her mother is and her mother's influence in her life. And no matter what she tried to do in terms of eliminating her mother from her life, no matter what you do, no matter how good or bad or indifferent your mother is to you, she will always be a part of you and your development forever. So the title meant something different for me because I said, okay, that at first I was like, why is it called forever? And then the more that I got into it, the more I realized this woman has been trying to recreate and reinvent herself from the age of six. And in everything that she has done, it was an effort to not be her mom. It was an effort to escape where she was born and raised in Harlem and to become someone else. And no matter what you do, who you are will always be a part of you. Who, who you were born from will always be a part of you forever. And so for me, that was the main takeaway, of course, and all of the other nuggets that Jordan lifted um, around forgiveness, um, mother-daughter relationships, black mother-daughter relationships, uh, and just the beauty uh, that comes from the beauty that can sometimes come from pain, from very painful beginnings. So those were takeaways for me. That's beautifully said, uh, Mimi, thank you. Um, I'll reiterate what uh, Nathalie has typed in. If you have questions for our actors or our directors, you can type them into the chat function, which is probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just click on that and then type in your message uh, and we'll, uh, we'll ask the question uh, for you, or if you want to turn your camera on and wave your hand, we can do it the old fashioned way as well. Uh, Byron, um, uh, two questions. Uh, did you know uh, Dale Orlando Smith's work at all, number one? And secondly, could you talk a little bit about um, uh, Until the Flood has many different perspectives, I guess, uh, you know, eight different um, perspectives. Is there a central organizing theme or is it simply about giving voice to a bunch of different people in the community and letting the chips fall where they may? Sure. Um, so I really the only Dale Orlando Smith piece that I've been sort of familiar with and I'm not even uh, super familiar with is Yellow Man, uh, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 02, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I knew her from there. Um, in a sense, you know, looked into a little bit about her. I love that she uh, doesn't uh, have a cell phone, from what I understand, and any social media, which today we're like, what? <laughs> it's amazing 
um, it's, you know, a nice little Luddite. You just don't see that uh, very often. And so that's amazing. Um, and then in regards to the central, th excuse me, central theme of Until the Flood, I think the central theme is the variety of perspectives um, and how we can all view even things, I would probably say, even if you are in the same economic background, I think people, um, things can be looked at different. And, and in that regard, I'm referring to Paul and Hassan, uh, both 16, 17 year old kids uh, from the same area, both say how they, while not really knowing Mike Brown, had either seen him, said hey to him, those kinds of things, right? But I think having totally different uh, perspectives on their approach to life and, and probably how that case affected them. So I, I think really, I, I would probably say the central theme is, hey, we're bringing all these people together. And you may think because some people share a hue um, or a gender, that they may look at things the same way, but that's not the case. You know, it's different with Louisa um, and uh, Edna, the two older black women I play. Different approaches to, you know, with Louisa who starts and ends the show. Um, I think there, she talks about hardness and Renee and I talked and, and Sarah, who is our um, assistant director who uh, has since flown back, we miss her, back to New York. But uh, we talked about Edna almost seeing the hardness in the case. And not Edna, excuse me, Louisa seeing the hardness and she always asks, what created this hardness? You were so close, Michael Brown, to getting out. You were so close to doing this, you were so close. Why did this happen? And you look at Edna, who, older black female as well, was saying, I just wanted to pray and I wanted to forgive. You know, so I love that some people may assume that you're gonna take characters of very similar ages, genders, races, and think that they may all think the same way about or have the same approach to the Michael Brown murder, but that's not the case. And I love that about it, playing with uh, perceptions and assumptions, which Ruben, the barber, talks about. Don't assume that you know me, uh, you know, young women coming from Northwestern University. Don't assume that because I live in this area that I'm innately intellectually inferior. Um, and so that is, and I, I've spoken to a few people uh, who have who've tuned in over the past couple of performances, and those lines certainly stand out too. Um, particularly some of my black male friends who are like who educate college level friends or so who say exactly that's what we're saying. Like we, we don't, it's not a monolith. So I think that was a big thing that I got from this is. Not everyone's a monolith. Not everyone who lives in the area, white or black, is going to approach the Michael Brown case in the same way. Well said, um, Byron. Um, Renee, uh, we have a, a question for you and then one for Mimi. Um, Renee, uh, what does the title of Until the Flood mean to you? The title of for Forever is uh, you know, by the time you finished reading or seeing the play, I think you have a, a sense of that. But what, what about Until the Flood? What does that mean to you, uh, Renee? I think to me, it means like all the emotions that um, like when a river breaks the dam and, the, and it floods and how you're just hit all at once. And um, Michael Brown's murder at the time in 2014, hit us all like, wait, what? This little boy had his hands up, like, why is he murdered? And then you fast forward through these past seven years and the stuff that we've seen these past seven years, especially last summer when we saw, um, saw the murder. And I mean, and how we were all flooded and how all of our emotions came up because the flood will bring things up to the surface that we didn't expect to see. And I think with this play, we get to see these eight characters' emotions and everything and how we're seeing things differently. Some things are similar, some things are different, but how they all understand what's going on and how it all affects all of them because it's bringing these emotions to the surface that they hadn't, well, some of them hadn't expected to deal with. 
Now, people like Louisa has always dealt with it. Ruben has always dealt with it. Edna has always dealt with it. But our two teenage boys, Hassan and Paul, they're getting into, this is how I have to feel. Like they felt it, but this brought it to a head. And for Connie, this is something a little bit more new for her. Rusty has felt it as being a police officer. He understands. And Doug Ray has felt emotion, but it's been more from his family and trying to fight some other issues that he has. That we, well, at least we interpret that he has. So all of this bringing stuff to the surface. And so you're flooded with emotions. Renee, um, what, can, what can we do about it? We need to pay attention and not just be in our own feelings. And we have to start looking through stuff through other people's eyes. Because if we don't, and if we all just think you have to see where people are coming from. And so we have to pay attention and listen. And we as a country just have to do better. We as a world have to do better. I, uh, I certainly agree with that. Um, uh, I'd like all of you to think about, oh, Byron, you want to say something about that, please? Uh, yeah, I, I just, if I could piggyback on what Renee said about listening, but the first thing, you hear so much about reconciliations, but if, if we don't actually call the problem for what it is, all the problems, what they are, we are, we can't keep sweeping things under the carpet. Um, we've had a problem for 401 years, 402 almost now, it's been 2021, right? Um, if we do not call things for what they are, if we don't actually talk about them instead of banded, putting a bandage over everything, it's going to continue. Um, so I think we can't begin to talk about how to fix it until we actually, actually talk about it and actually call the issues for what they are and have, and then start to figure out solutions to our problems. Who is but if you can identify the problem, you have no idea how to actually fix it. You, you say we have to identify it. Who is we, uh, Byron? Is, is there a specific answer to that or is it literally? Mm. <laughs> uh, I, Renee wants to answer also. So. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know what? I am going to, I'm going to let them answer. When I, I do feel like, yes, uh, it is going to take all of us, but truth be told, some people got a little bit more work to do than others. <laughs> uh, and that's what I'll say on that, and I'll turn, <laughs> I'll turn it over to them. Renee? Actually, I was going to say exactly what you say. Actually, all of us need to work on it, but yes, yeah, some people have a little bit more work to do. Okay, a little bit more work to do than others, and paying attention and not thinking that everything because um, Doug Ray says a line about white privilege, and you know, I wasn't born in the privilege. But what, um, but to be understood is that white privilege isn't <coughs> money or anything like that. White privilege is the fact that you can go into any store and not be followed. When I, um, I remember going to the store with an um, older woman from my church, and it was an expensive store, and we were followed the whole time. And what the people in the store did not realize is that she had enough money that she could have bought anything out of that store and not had to worry about the price of it. When there was a white woman in the other side of the room who might not have been able to buy anything. And as we've seen a couple of white women stealing, but they weren't followed because of the color of their skin. And that's part of the privilege. And that once we can really start talking about this, but not talking about it with just liberal people and not just black people talking about it, but we need our white counterparts to talk about it too amongst themselves and so that things can change. I can only really change stuff in my community and I can embrace it, but unless other people on the other side are saying it too and saying, hey, this isn't right. Like what's going on at the Capitol right now? The Capitol was stormed. We all know that that was wrong. And until the people who know that that was wrong say, hey, you know what? This wasn't right. We need to fix this. There is a problem here. And until they do something, it's going to happen again. 
I hear you're right. Um, I think there's another issue, if you don't mind, you guys don't mind me saying one thing about this, um, you know, where police brutality is concerned, which is the, the most specific uh, issue, I think, of, uh, of until the pl a flood, one of the issues is that the people who determine what culpability, the people who determine whether the officer was going beyond the call of duty, um, uh, it are people who literally live in the same community as the police officer and, and often work in the same building, uh, right? They're members of city councils, county commissioners, that sort of thing. And so uh, district attorneys. And so there's a sense of, I would imagine, I've never been in that position, but I would imagine there's a sense of reticence to, to hold somebody like that accountable because they are patrolling your street and they might be coming for you next. And so I think what's needed is a national uh, grand jury selection where people from outside of your community are selected to, to immediately look at the instances such as the one we experienced last summer, but but other ones too that are not quite so cut and dried as that, uh, uh, so that people can make a determination without being fearful for their own lives if they if they do so. Uh, that's my two cents. Um, Mimi, we have a question from the audience for you. Um, this is from Joy Bryant, who's a, another uh, wonderful actress in our community. Uh, hello, Joy. Uh, Joy says, uh, ha having been reared in a family that was not like that of your character, how did you approach the character and how did you arrive at a, a point of authenticity for the character? Um, so thank you for that. And uh, Joy is also uh, a, a member of my sorority. So, hey, Soror, <laughs> Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Um, so, good question, because thank thankfully, uh, this woman's mother uh, was no way near any resemblance of Roberta Imogene uh, Cowan's at all. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and so what I had to do was kind of go back through my arsenal of research. Um, I spent some time watching Precious again, which um, is probably the only work out there right now that really talks about a very um, tense and incestuous relationship um, between a mother and daughter. Um, and I, what I did was I dusted off my Uta Hagen training from Jerome Davis. <clears throat> and I gave my characters some backstory. And I gave them some things that were not in the play as to what ways for me to understand them. Because we, we seek to find understanding. Okay, we, we seek, we, 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 we have to gain understanding of a thing in order to be authentic in that thing. Um, and so I did some deep diving with the mother. I had to. Um, and I did some deep, some deep diving with the unnamed woman as well. Um, and I see another question here from Akisha, who's also my soror and my sans uh, that I crossed delta with. How did I recover from the repeated emotional performance of the role and what it demands? First and foremost, I am thankful, very thankful to Burning Cold Theater for bringing in um, a theater therapist and an intimacy coach to help me choreograph um, the um, sexual assault scene. And one of the tools that I learned was this five senses closure exercise so that I could pull myself out of the emotion of what was going on and in that blackout, give myself 45 seconds to a minute to compose myself by doing five things. There's a glass of water on the table. So I drink the water. The glass has texture on it on purpose so I can feel the glass. It is a cool, there's ice in the glass and I want to feel the coolness of the glass, okay? I wear perfume every day, so I smell my wrist while I'm in the blackout. And 
I, when, when I am ready, because I was given autonomy and control of when I would be ready to come out of that scene and go to the next beat, I could then hit the table to let the crew know she's about to stand up and walk to her next mark. And when I got to the next mark, I would tap my foot to let them know that they could bring the lights back up. So I went through five senses to close me out of that horrific ordeal and the trauma associated with it so I could take the story forward and continue to tell the story. Um, and so the research that I had to do, in addition to the bringing the authenticity of the character to the stage, the other thing that drove me forward was the fact that I wanted to do right by Dale Orlando Smith. No one other than Dale has ever done this role on stage. So I knew that I was making history and I knew that Burning Coal was making history and so was the city of Raleigh, okay? And so there was, it was a, it was a huge lift and it was heavy. And a lot of what Byron said is so true. Uh, many times throughout the, this ordeal, Byron and I both went, oh my God, have we bitten off more than what we could chew here? Can we do this, right? Um, but at the end of the day, the responsibility to make sure that the material, that, that I brought integrity to that and that I did right by it was paramount and first and foremost for me. And I needed to do whatever it was necessary to get me to this space to be able to bring it uh, onto the stage and leave it all out there for you all. Jordan, um, uh, Rita has uh, uh, asked about the removal of layers of clothing during the show. Is that something that happened in rehearsal? Is that an idea that you brought in? How did that happen and did it help to tell the story in some way? Was it symbolic? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Rita, for asking this question. Um, at first, it just was a, que a question of costuming, um, like what was she going to wear in Paris? And then how are we going to transition from that to when she's back in Harlem with her mom and going through all these things? Um, so yeah, the way that we choreographed that with the removing of individual pieces, in my mind at least, um, it is sort of like a, a symbolic effect of her taking down these layers of the person she is in the present in Pierre Lachaise and going back, being yanked back as she says in the script, but with, by her mother to like um, go back and go through all that, what happened in her childhood with her mother. Um, so I just lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, so it was real. It was intentional as being like a layering thing, kind of stripping down. We're going to take this ride. I'm going to tell you my past, what happened, and then putting it back on to get to where she is now and the place that she is now, both physically and emotionally, mentally, um, as the woman that she feels the most happiest with and is most beautiful uh, being. Yeah. That all makes perfect sense to me. Um, I'm uh, gonna, we're, we're at the half, uh, half hour uh, mark, a little bit past the half hour mark. So uh, we're gonna just take a couple more questions. We have one uh, to Byron. Um, was there any uh, one character that you played that gave you new insights personally, uh, either specifically into that case or, or more broadly speaking into um, life? Um, <laughs> these, oh my gosh, like inhabiting these characters uh, in particular, I, so Doug Ray, who was our, what I like to call resident fascist and, and want to be Nazi, and particularly when he actually references wanting to take on the very same act that uh, Aim and Goeth uh, from Schindler's List did, um, he says something in the play about when he goes over to the two homes that he has in the uh, black part of town in Ferguson and how he sees some of the, the, the black guys with uh, breaking windows and getting high and, and then he talks about the use of the n-word and you know the fact that 
he's seeing black people use it, but then they get mad if they hear uh, white people use it. Well, <laughs> I'm reminded of someone that I dated, who, uh, and this person was white, and we were at dinner, and they asked me the same thing. Why can't I, if I'm listening to a rap song, why can't I use that word? And I drop my fork because we had never encountered anything like this in our relationship before. And everything changed. We broke up two days later. But everything changed because they were steadfast in saying, but it's used all the time. It's used all the time, but, 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 but you know, and I tried to explain the history. And that devolved into the sheer amount of homeless people in downtown Raleigh. Um, and that they, they couldn't help it if they were white and born with money. So um, the fact that then playing that character, right? And then also everything that happened on January 6th with the insurrection, um, I definitely have some new, some new Paul nuance, excuse me, not Paul, some new Doug Ray nuances there. So there are certain things that I, and conversations that I've had in real life with people that um, while the play didn't necessarily shed new light on it, it helped to illuminate things that I already knew and felt and things that I could access, but also try to do it safely because emotion memory can be a dangerous thing if it's not done uh, properly. So thank goodness for lots of training on that. Um, and you know, hearing what Mimi went through um, with her intimacy coaching, like the certain things like that I've been taught over the years. Um, yeah, there was just one, thinking about Hassan, the, the character, the 17 year old who plays the, the, the drums or the buckets, um, him talking about sometimes wanting to stand in front of a gun and just wanting to leave this place, that just, while I've not necessarily been there, that was something, that was a new emotion, like someone who feels so much despair that they want to go before. And not only this, right, not only in a very specific way, him saying, oh, I don't want to jump off something. I don't want to pull a gun to my head. I want to go be before a racist cop and have that cop in my life. That is so specific. The specificity in that is breathtaking. So getting in and out of that character sometimes can, can be a bit much for me. Um, because I go next to Connie, who is an ally, but, um, you know, with reservations, right? So, um, yes, I, I may have gotten off track a little bit of that, but, but basically inhabiting all of these characters have basically highlighted so many of the conversations that I've had uh, with friends and loved ones uh, over the course of my 40 years on this earth. And so just using that in the show, but trying to do it safely um, so that I am able to maintain uh, my sanity um, and my self-worth by the end of it, and my, and my dignity, right? Bringing, bringing dign dignity to, um, we recently lost two days ago, one of the greatest, Miss Cicely Tyson. Um, and one thing that Cicely Tyson, that was big on her, big for her was to approach every, every role with dignity. And she refused to take some roles. And when I was a kid getting into theater, I actually sat down with my parents and we said there were certain things that I would not do. I just wouldn't, that I would always try to bring dignity and class and grace to whatever I was doing. And being able to inhabit all these characters allowed me to do that. And uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Cicely Tyson and that lesson that we should all try to approach everything we do with grace and class and dignity. And if more people did that, this would be a better place. It's the, it's in, in uh, microcosm, the, the task of, of the actor, especially it's really true of any artist, but I think for actors, especially that's true because in some sense, our body is the, the art, you know, um, um, we have one more uh, question, um, and it's from Mrs. Rutland. Mrs. Rutland, this is uh, a, a long question. Do you want to just ask it yourself uh, uh, of Mimi? Can you hear me? Yes. 
Well, as an elementary behavioral specialist or a therapist in a, um, a predominantly um, diverse, not, not very, really diverse, but a very um, low economic um, driven uh, school, I have kids that live similar stories. They come in and they share uh, such painful um, stories about their home life. And it, it's my job to always try to give them the brighter side that, you know, there's only six more years that you'll be in that house if you do the right things here. And I really love the, the, the way the play allowed um, the character to go through snapshots. And I, I'm gonna steal some of that because I, I, it allowed the character there to actually walk back through years in the present and it was it was just amazing to see that and i was curious if mimi doing the time that you were walking back um was it hard to not actually walk back your through your own life um i did have to pull from some of my own life to bring some of the authenticity um i unfortunately have lost both my parents and um, was, you know, and both my parents died. Um, my father died at 95. So I watched him transition and my mother died at 73. Um, and having been that person that helped to plan their homegoing services from beginning to end, what they wore every step of the way uh, in and out of hospitals, hospice and all of that, I pulled from those hospital experiences, um, especially when um, her mother was in and out of um, the hospital, uh, losing her ability to see and things of that nature. Uh, I've, I've lost family members to diabetes and to um, kidney failure. And an aunt watched her transition as well. So I did pull from real life a lot of times for that. Uh, concerning um, the ability to utilize snapshots as a healing tool, I think that is an excellent idea. Uh, and those are those snapshots. You can snap, you can take a snapshot of anything. You can take a snapshot of the good, take a snapshot of, of the bad. But for in the instance of those children, who are living this reality every day, if you can find a way to help them find snapshots of the good for them to always come back to, that would be excellent. Because one of the things that she, as she was living through the latter part of her life, um, through her mother's latter part of her life, unbeknownst to her, she began to interact with her mother and it was coming back to her as journal entries and snapshots. And those chronological times in her life where um, their relationship was not only fragile, it was fractured, it was hostile, it was ugly. And then we find out of all of that, unfortunately, after her mother leaves this earth is when she comes to true, truly forgive her. And in many instances I've heard of from friends and other family members, Sometimes it takes for some folks to leave this earth before you can begin to live. And I have heard that story over and over and over um, from other people. And I did pull from real life in order to bring that to, um, to the stage. Well, thank you very much for that. It was, it was a, a, an amazing play. I truly enjoyed it and plan on uh, seeing the other play, both of them together next weekend. So uh, thank you both for um, sharing your life with us in on theater in theater thank you thank you mrs rutland for what you do and uh, i think renee uh you need to get with mrs rutland about your next play <laughs> that sounds like that sounds like a play waiting to happen right there um, yes. well, thank you guys uh we'll um we'll wrap up uh now um and uh, i just want to say thank you all for for spreading help us spread the word if you can 
uh, about the play. We run uh, two more weeks uh, and the performance is taking place live on stage uh, Thursday through Sunday. Um, so, um, so thank you all. And, uh, and I appreciate all your work and, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in round two next week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, everyone.